In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and our heart shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation, through Christ our Lord. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, our Lady, Cause of our Joy, pray for us. Thank you for inviting me to be with you again. A great privilege for me. I wanted to try to divide <coughs> this little talk into three sections, not quite of the same length. But first of all, I wanted just to pause for a moment and try and consider how things stand for us at the moment. This is, of course, partly a personal impression. It seems to me at the moment that you and I are in the middle of a battle whose urgency and fierceness seems to be increasing. All around us, we see the consequences of violence and discord. Not only are the two leaders of our main parties in this country being asked to retire on grounds of lack of confidence, but we see Europe in a turmoil, financial difficulties, and especially attacks on Christians, 14 countries at the moment, actively persecuting the Catholic Church. In addition to that, there is an attack on family life, on sexual love, on morals, and upon sound doctrine. And alas, we find that there are attacks from within. Not all Catholic Christians are aware of the traditional teaching of the church, nor do they always accept the authority. Even, it seems, the clergy are from time to time at fault. And you might say that this battle is at another stage as well, because it is within us. We find ourselves threatened within our hearts with doubts and difficulties, with temptations, with despondency and impatience. And we find ourselves saying, what on earth is going on? And people ring me up and say, we want downsides prayers because everybody and everything seems to have gone mad where we are living. Sometimes they're talking of their place of work. Sometimes they're talking about their family. From this, you and I may reach the conclusion, quite rightly I think, that we are very much in the battle, and because we're trying to lead a life of prayer, we are particularly under fire at the moment. A great grace is being given, a great stage in the battle has been reached, and you and I are feeling it suddenly with a sense of shock and surprise sometimes, and wondering if things can possibly get worse. I'll say nothing of the insidious dangers of the internet, of the media, and of the temptations of our young people to lead a double life, one with their family and another a secret website endeavor, making for a double life in the comfort and secrecy of their own rooms. And indeed, even at Downside, I fear, we are aware, as you probably are as well, of former pupils being demonized on the net and from being lawful and upright and hardworking pupils are suddenly turned into irrational beings seeking death, violence and destruction. To confirm all this, the Blessed Virgin Mary has been appearing in many different countries at this time, so many that I couldn't possibly enumerate them, but it is unusual that she is appearing in almost every part of the world. <clears throat> Not all of them have been authenticated or recognized. Some have, <clears throat> some quite swiftly indeed. Others seem to take longer. We should remember that, for example, Lourdes took a very long time to be accepted, to be authenticated, as it were, even though the persons who received those messages especially St. Bernadette, were an eloquent demonstration of the holiness of the message. Many earlier prophecies that Our Lady has given seem to me to, being, to be fulfilled at this time. She saw at 
for example, in Ecuador uh, some 200 years ago, the difficulties <coughs> which the church would face, especially in South America. She even prophesied there through Mariana de Jesus the assassination of the Catholic president. And other prophecies, we think especially of Fatima, indicate this time as a testing period for the church and for the world, for society and indeed its very structures as well. Never before has family life been so violently threatened. At the same time, we bear in mind the texts in the Gospel where Jesus says that in the end days the faith will grow cold and men's hearts will become hardened. We see now a definite hardness of heart in so many areas where in this country one pregnancy in two is terminated. It may be a lot more since we don't know the consequences of such, I won't even mention them, morning after pills and so forth, which are actually early term abortions. With all these difficulties, there goes, alas, a shortage of clergy. Here I can speak with a special relevance because I am frequently in demand by people who consider themselves sheep without a shepherd. Often enough, I have to say no, and they have to sigh deeply and wonder why no one hears their urgent plea. In all this, the message of Our Lady, and this is the second point really, in all this difficulty, Our Lady wants us to be persons of faith and trust and hope, mother of holy hope, the scriptures tell us. Now, hope is sometimes seen as looking forward to some future event, a holiday or whatever it is, which you know about. But in its absolute sense, hope is not a thing or an event, but Christ, and Mary is the mother of Christ. Christ is our hope, therefore she is the mother of holy hope. She it is, we say, you may recall, in that famous prayer, the Hail Holy Queen, hail our life, our sweetness, and our hope. And therefore we turn to her in our, our difficulties, confident that she hears us. The great prayer that is so powerful, as Padre Pio told us, is prayer directed with and through the Blessed Virgin. We're here today to bear witness to it. She leads us to Christ, she supports us, she protects us, she advises us. She is entrusted with us, since on the cross, our Saviour gave John to her <coughs> and asked her to be his mother and our mother too. And so we have a very special love for our mother, which of course is nothing compared to her love for us. I remember my father once saying that he was struggling with faith a bit, and I had to point out to him that of course God believed in him a lot more than he believed in God. And that was indeed a consolation to him towards the end of his life. Now the Blessed Virgin Mary has rightly pointed out that we have all the weapons we need in one sense to deal with our part in the battle today. She wants us to be persons of regular prayer, of sacrifice and of fasting. Now the fasting need not always be from food. Surely, as she points out herself, fasting could involve keeping away from net shopping, for example, from surfing the net from wasting time in front of useless websites, some of them actually damaging, from watching too much television, through idle chatter and gossip. All of these must be curtailed for those of us who simply don't have time to waste in our work as her representatives and <coughs> disciples of her son. She wants us to be persons of repentance at this time, regular confession she rec recommends. And indeed, you and I are sort of trustees in this area. In this year of mercy, you and I are called, <clears throat> so it seems, to seek mercy for others as well, have mercy upon us and upon the whole world. And so we go to confession, we repent, 
we fast and pray and make sacrifice on behalf of others who are not, perhaps they can't come, perhaps they're not interested. <clears throat> but you and I are trustees of grace, and strictly speaking, there is no limit to what we can give away. <clears throat> Our Lady wants us to be persons of peace, heroically patient when everyone around us is so irritable, so touchy, so volatile, so ready to flare up in indignation and anger. I remember on one occasion my father saying to my mother peaceably, I agree with you, dear, and she said, can't you see I'm trying to have an argument? So you can see <laughs> there are people who can be very provoking indeed, and indeed wish to provoke you as well. Um, as a consequence, it's very difficult. Sometimes we find strife in our families, groups of people not speaking to anybody else, groups of people nursing grudges, people, people brushing up old wounds. And I find myself saying to people, well, this is a terrible thing you've been telling me. When did it happen? Oh, before the war. And I'm, <laughs> I'm tempted to say, well, which war? You know, you can see. But it's been brushed up and kept going, and they haven't spoken to the other side of the family since that dreadful deed. And you can see, in a way, it's high time that we put the past behind us, all the past and everything in it, including, as it happens, our own shortcomings. Repent, give them to God, and press on. Now, the evil one's attacks on us come from outside, but they also come from inside, as I pointed out. And if he can't get you to sin seriously, and I hope he can't, he then tries to put into your mind discouraging, despondent, and depressing things, suggesting how bad you are, how bad you've been, how badly you've been treated, how it's all really a bit of a waste of time, and anyway, you're feeling very weary with the whole situation. <clears throat> I remember on one occasion delivering a class at Downside, which was especially well prepared, and I said at the end, were there any questions? And a hand shot up and said, can't you try and make it interesting? So you, see, <laughs> so you can see there are occasions when one's best efforts seem to be unavailing. As a consequence, we are invited by the evil one to suggest that really God is too busy doing something else, busy with important people and important events, and hasn't got time to deal with us. Don't you believe it? The hairs on your head are counted, says the Lord. He's not having to take quite so long counting mine, as you can imagine, but nonetheless, he knows me better than I know myself. He wants us in this year to be reconciled with others, and that may take a bit of doing if they don't actually want to be reconciled or are so prickly that you hardly dare to come near them. We ask then their angels to help them, and we ask God to help us by our prayers to bring them closer to him and then to us. Reconciliation is indeed possible. It takes a long time. It often works rather slowly, but you and I are called at this time to undertake that. Our Lady's messages want us, in the first instance, to recite the creed. She says it's not recited often enough or with sufficient reverence. She wants us not only to love the Mass, but to live the Mass, as she says, living out in our daily round that sacrifice which we offer with Christ to the Father, living out his indwelling, Christ's indwelling within us through the Holy Eucharist. He is never actually absent. Now, the business of forgiving, as you realize, is not completely straightforward. We can say we forgive our nearest, but not always dearest, and still retain a certain ill feeling, certain sense of injury. Forgiveness is therefore an act of the will, and memories linger on, and we have to give them to God and ask him to heal. At the same time, forgiveness involves recognizing that we too may have provoked that person. Sometimes we provoke others without realizing it even. People sometimes say rather sharply to me in the parish, all very well for you, Father Michael, not a care in the world. And I realize, 
<laughs> if only they knew, I thought, but I didn't say that. But their perception was that basically I wasn't married and therefore the delights of family life were denied me. I didn't have an income, so I didn't bother, didn't have to bother keeping the inland revenue happy. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it is remarkable, actually, that the auditors at Downside, who like to look at parishes as well and their finances rather carefully, have not yet succeeded in unearthing my Mars bar fund, which is entitled, as you probably know, clerical support. The messages that Our Lady give at this time all coincide. There's nothing specially new, you might say. It is the sense of urgency which is special, but she is speaking to us of the gospel message of our Saviour. It is a call to relive and to be renewed in the gospel. She wants us to give ourselves to the Holy Spirit in this year, for it is the Holy Spirit indwelling us who gives us that great gift of joy. In St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, remember the Galatians come out of St. Paul's um, ministry very badly indeed. He writes a letter to them, the letter to the Galatians, which breathes fire and brimstone from the very opening lines. No pleasant greeting about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gets straight down to the point with the Galatians. If he doesn't have an immediate response and signs of repentance, he's going to come and sort them all out. Fortunately, they avoid that unhappy episode and come to heal. Towards the end, in chapter 5, he points out to them that the signs of the Holy Spirit, signs, he points out, which are not there, notably absent in Galatia, the signs of the Holy Spirit are, first, charity, and secondly, joy. If the Holy Spirit is in your heart, you must be persons of joy. And if you're not persons of joy, you're not giving a proper signal to the world, for the world looks at each one of you carefully. Here comes a Christian, what difference does it make? And if you're gloomy, sour, despondent, morose, I could add to those adjectives, I'll leave you to do that, then it's a question to be asked. Surely, this is the year, this is the day, to sort that out with vigor. Allow the Holy Spirit to indwell your heart and to cleanse your heart as well. He wants free action in your heart, so we can't circumscribe. It's like going to the doctor and deciding you're not going to let him examine you, or rather, you're not going to let him ask you those unkind questions about your lifestyle. It happened to me. I had a parishioner come to see me a few days ago because the new young doctor can be a little bit abrupt. And she was mortally offended because as she came in, he just pointed to the scales. So <laughs> you can imagine that did not go down very well. And I, I was in the awkward position of having to defend the young doctor and her at the same time from her outraged feelings. Perhaps, I said, the young doctor was trying to say something important. Yeah, needless to say, we're working on the reconciliation there as well. Now, if Our Lady is indeed the cause of our joy, causa nostra letizia, as the beautiful litany of Loretto says, she is actually calling us to a slightly different joy from the joy that the world <coughs> tries to give. There's no doubt about it, many people here in Bristol, and indeed we may, might even say in the Mendip Hills, fondly imagine that their search for joy can actually succeed. A bit more money in the bank, promotion, another car, holiday, hairdo. I gather that's something that gives people joy. I'm not quite sure why. Anyway, so <laughs> a sexist comment, I'm afraid, but there we are. You can see that um, the world has this notion that joy is to be found in this world, more of something or other, whatever that may be, whatever they particularly live for. You and I know that, strictly speaking, this world cannot give joy moments, indeed, of satisfaction. There's no doubt about it. If you're hungry, a good deal, a good meal delivers the goods. However, we have to say that the joy that Christians have and wish to impart to others, which Our Lady wishes to grant us, is not of this world. It is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. It, her, it is her protecting guidance. 
And we're called to be joyful, not because things are going well. <clears throat> things may not be going at all well for us. <coughs> Excuse me. Things may be actually going rather badly. Perhaps we're not feeling very well. Perhaps, in my case, the abbot doesn't really understand me. I have to pray for his discernment, of course. And as a consequence, all sorts of factors outside may indicate that we have good reason not to be joyful. But we are called to rejoice in the Lord. It's interesting, in the early church, great conversions of pagans were achieved because of the joyfulness of the early Christians, even when persecuted, how these Christians rejoice and love one another. And the Christians were able to sing hymns even as they were heading for execution. It was a joy that didn't come from this life and was stronger than the outrages that this life and people in this life can inflict upon us. We have a right, indeed a duty, to ask Our Lady, cause of our joy, to help us at this time to be persons of joy and hope and love. She is our mother in the order of grace. She is indeed the mother of grace, since Christ is grace, and she is his mother. And so we can ask her for graces we think we need. Sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart and suggests that we do actually ask for something we hadn't thought of before, extra patience or insight or perhaps the knowledge of some difficult problem. Now, obviously, we have at hand wonderful helpers whom we do not always speak of or think of. I mentioned the angels in the first instance. Your angel guardian has been with you from the moment of your conception, and he cannot leave you, even if you fall into serious sin. So, therefore, talk to your angel. He is there as your servant, not as your policeman. And he is there because he loves you and cares about you, He is privileged to have charge of you. Remember, you can receive Holy Communion. He can't. He hasn't got a body. As a consequence, it is right to ask the angels to help us and protect us and to be at our side when we're about to do or say something which is fundamentally selfish or damaging. There are times when words leap to mind, perhaps true in their way, but criticisms that do not help others. And so, therefore, Ask your angel to forestall, to anticipate, and to hold you back. Sometimes silence can be eloquent. <clears throat> In addition to that, our angels are accompanied by other angels. There are many angels present here, for example, and it is right on occasions to speak to the angels of other people, especially if they're the sort of persons who don't go in for that sort of thing, like angels. You do, and you're entitled to address them. You have the authority to do so, but not only the authority, you have the obligation to do so. What if you were the trustee of funds in a bank, and there were lots there, and people were starving outside? How would it be if you didn't go into the bank and reach for the cash? Therefore, be generous in your joy. Be generous in your forgiveness. Praise and thank God. Ask the saints to assist you. They are your family, and they care about you as members of our family care about us. My mother went on caring almost to the day of her death about me, and because she couldn't get at me in the monastery, she used to ring up and say, I'm very worried indeed about you, dear. You're not taking your vitamin pills, are you? And I would say, I am indeed. And she said, I know you're not. I think I'll have to write to the abbot. So you can see that the saints are still more concerned. And we can, with quite considerable justification, know they are on hand in these difficult times. I think some saints are particularly suited to us and our needs. And we can now, with the use of the internet, find a little bit out about the sort of saints we'd like to receive help from. I've always been fond of St. Bernardine of Siena, not a saint everybody knows, except in Siena, I suppose, but he was called by God to be a hermit, and he was a hermit for a whole morning. By lunchtime, he'd had enough and went back to his <laughs> monastery. 
there, I felt, was a man after my own heart. So, that, so you can see that when things are difficult in the monastery, I call on St. Bernardine of Siena just to say a prayer or two, not necessarily for myself, but for all the other members of the community who are so difficult. And of course, if only they were like me, I say to myself. Some practical suggestions for you, by way of conclusion, because I've gone on far too long, I'm afraid. But we do live in a situation now where we have to be practically minded. There are things you've got to take away from today to help you and others. In the first instance, you must banish absolutely from today all the wrongful, negative, depressing thoughts that the evil one tries to put in our minds. We need, if you like, the healing of memories, the healing of the heart. Do not worry about tomorrow. Do not try to see the future. That's in God's hands. Do not try to live the future. The present is sufficiently exciting and sometimes rather more exciting than we could wish. And, of course, the future is in God's hands, and he'll be there when it comes to pass as our present. The cleansing of heart enables God to live in our heart, and if it's unpeaceful, he cannot feel fully at home. So, therefore, we have to make the deliberate decision not to let into our hearts the wrong thoughts, the revengeful, angry, embittered thoughts, or the despondent thoughts that can weigh us back. This cleansing of the heart involves our cooperation, just as to be healed by the greatest doctor involves our allowing ourselves to be examined. Be persons of regular prayer during the day. Thank God for very ordinary things like sunshine, food, and clothing. As you approach an event or an encounter, offer it to the Lord so he's there. I have a parishioner, a doctor in Bath, and he prays for his patients, whoever they are, he doesn't know who they are, on his way to work, so that without their knowing it, when they arrive in his uh, surgery, they've already been prayed for, and they wonder how it is he seems to know what's the matter. So therefore, yes, of course, it's sometimes a disappointment because you're rather anxious to tell the doctor all about it anyway. So you can see, be persons there who allow the Lord to act in your heart. Be regular persons of prayer and allow the Holy Spirit to pray within you according to the mind of God. And remember, the Holy Spirit prays within you even at night. Remember, the psalmist says, I will bless the Lord who even at night directs my heart. And in all this, be utterly sure that no matter what failings we have, no matter what failings other people tell us we have, God still loves us and cares about us. He does not expect us to be perfect, but to seek perfection. And I'm always a little bit worried about those who tell me that they're doing particularly well in the per perfection stakes. And really, if only other people could imitate them, things would be a lot better in this world. I leave you with a final request. Keep us in your prayers and remember the importance of your work as intercessors. The Lord listens to your prayers with a special love and attention. You have the pearl of great price, and this is the time to put it to use. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you. Oh.